Well, we appreciate everyone being here tonight in the midst of a busy week. We're in the process of studying the book of John, and we'll be going into chapter 17 tonight. I will try to pull us up a little bit to ready to enter the end by noticing what we stressed in the last chapter. In that chapter, the Lord stressed that he was going back to the Father, that he will come again to the disciples. And as we spent some time on, he will send them the Holy Spirit basically to enable them to do what he called them to do as apostles of Christ, with emphasis given to the fact that the Holy Spirit would be the one to reveal the truth of Jesus Christ to them infallibly and enable them to miraculous things to confirm the word with signs following, the miracles being signs that the message was from God and not from man. He also stressed that the Spirit would guide them not just in that way, but into all truth. Give a little more emphasis to the all truth thing. He, in the first century, guided them into all truth necessary for a person to be saved from past sins, in other words, to become a Christian, and to live faithfully in the Lord's church, to which he adds them when they're baptized for the remission of sins, Acts 2, 38 and verse 47. To be faithful, steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in work of the Lord until their life is over or he returns. So that lets us know that any other revelation, any other thing, teaching, that is contrary to what's in the last will and testament of Christ, the New Testament of the Bible, is simply false doctrine, thus originating with the devil. Now, if you want to get a fuller statement of that, read Galatians chapter 1. I might mention there that the first big problem in the church had to do with making laws where God didn't make any, uh, binding where God has not bound in his word. And that was um, coming from Jews who obeyed the gospel. But they wanted to keep the Gentiles second-rate citizens, basically. And thus they were requiring them, some of those Jews were, they were converted to be circumcised to keep the law. And Paul deals with them in Galatians and then more detailed treaties is found even in the book of Hebrews connected with the book of, of Romans. So the spirit in the first century revealed the mind of Christ completely and infallibly and put it into words, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, Ephesians 6, 17. And then lastly, in the former chapter, or that is chapter 16, Jesus speaks to the disciples um, concerning their conduct in what was about to happen in his arrest and in his um, uh, crucifixion, of course, all that went along with that, they still thought that they could stay with him and would, as Peter boasted, but they were going to learn it's one thing to boast things and declare great things, another thing under terrible pressure to be able to live up to them. Now we come to chapter 17, and in verses one through eight, remember what we've been doing. We've been urging each person to read each verse for himself or herself. Then we've tried to emphasize the facts contained therein. Don't lose sight of the, of the importance of John. It's designed to convict people that Christ Jesus is the only begotten son of God, that he is who he claimed to be. So while there are many lessons, many other lessons we draw from this book, as well as Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, we don't lose sight of the fact that they're written to convince people that Jesus is the Son of God, who he claimed to be in John 14, 6, the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man comes to the Father but by him. I think we forget sometimes that those four books were written in the first century designed to convert people to Christ. And they did it with evidence. 
and they thought that written evidence of the first century was fully capable of converting anybody to Christ. So whether it was the spoken word or the written word, it was designed to cause people to come to a full belief in Christ, such a belief that is an obedient belief. So in verses 1 through 8, we continue on as John by inspiration has selected these things to notice that Jesus is engaged in prayer. What's interesting is that this is the, these verses I mentioned had to do with Jesus praying on his own behalf. I guess sometimes we don't think about that being he is the second person of the Godhead, the eternal word tabernacled in the flesh. But as a man, he went through everything a human being would. He was capable of all kinds of feelings and emotions, fears or whatever. The difference in him and all the rest of us as he had the, if you want to call it this, the internal wherewithal, the spiritual wherewithal to overcome all of it and never sin. As the writer of Hebrews said, he was tempted in every point like as we are. That temptation there is the devil soliciting him to sin. Tempted in every point like as we are, yet without sin. He could do that. And I guess here we ought all, in all honesty, cried hallelujah because if he hadn't we wouldn't be doing this right now so he prayed for himself and he says you know now it's come before we came across times that his hour had not come that is the time for him to die had not come uh, think about that for a minute we know that all things are to be done decently in order and that can't be done without a rule of action or laws if you think of all of the universe, you know all of it is ordered. And that can't be done except by rules and laws. And when it comes to the spiritual things, then a law being a rule of action, whether it's in the physical world or whether it's the spiritual world, then all of these things are ordered. So that means that Christ knew the exact time that he was to die. Not before, not after. Just as Paul said to the Galatians, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son. There was a time for Christ to be born. There was a time for him to die. God is omniscient. What does that mean? He knows all that is the object of knowledge. God does not come to know anything like you do and I do. All things knowable are part of his very nature, which flows from his essence, which essence is eternal. Thus, whatever can be known flowed from God. And that's an important point to keep in mind. So Jesus confesses to the Father in his petition to him, Father, the hour has come. It's come for me now to go through physical death and all of the terrible ordeal that led up to his physical death. Now, James tells us that the body apart from the spirit is dead. None of us know what it's like to experience our spirits leaving our bodies, but we can know that that's the best definition of death you're going to get. We can get a little bit of a picture of that by reading a about uh, Luke in Luke 16, or re rather reading about the rich man Lazarus in Luke 16. And you see that when Lazarus died, the angels carried him into Abraham's bosom. When Christ died on the cross, he said to the thief, Verily I say unto thee today, shalt thou be with me in paradise. Thereby paradise equates with Abraham's bosom. Um, place of departed spirits known as the Hadean world, and if you look at Luke 16, you'll see there's the great gulf that separates the spirits of the righteous and the innocent from those who are unrighteous and lost. And that's a temporary place. It exists for one reason. Death still happens. Well, death happens. Why? Because of sin. Paul tells us in the Corinthian epistle 
to the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Of course, Christ is the first fruits of them that slept. He's already gone through the process. He's already blazed the trail. And he's told us in the last will and testament how to get from where we are now to where he is now. And the very process is enough is said about it, though we'd like a lot more. Uh, enough is said about it for us to understand these things. But he realized it. I came from the Father, he's already said. I'm going back to the Father, he told his apostles. Now he says, it's, it's time to make the trip. Father, the hour's come. Notice what he says, glorify thy son, that the son may glorify thee. Well, he's talking about performing the actual act that was involved in his death and the reason he was dying. He knows more than anybody else I have sinned. And only those die who are guilty of sin. That's the reason Haiti and world could not hold him. Is because it was meant for a place where people who have sinned go because of the curse back in Eden. The moment that they partook of the Adam and Eve of the forbidden fruit, then immediately they died spiritually. That is, they were separated from God. But then they begin to die physically. And since sin found its doorway into the world in that way, and all men have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23, then, as Paul said in Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. Which, again, I emphasize death does not mean annihilation or unconsciousness. It simply means separation. So Jesus is about to undergo that uh, separation, death. Now, hearken back here to, you may remember, the fact that there was the Mount of Transfiguration. And when uh, Moses and Elijah spoke to him, they were all transfigured. That is, they were not in the flesh. The scripture tells us they spoke to him about his decease. Well, I must tell you, that makes me want to know, what do they tell him? What information they give him about the actual process or the moment the spirit leaves the body? Well, we don't know. We've got about all that we can, but that's something he had come from God through two men who had died. And uh, that's a very important point to keep in mind as to the comfort given him. But notice, no matter how much comfort was given to him of knowing exactly what would happen, he still had to go through it. And it's one thing to know all the processes of things. It's another thing to go through those processes. You know that I always hearken back to things to do with history and many times uh, parallels with the great Normandy invasion of June 6, 1944. Now, those fellows had trained and trained and trained. There's no way we can realize how much they had trained. But I don't care how much they trained. They still had to go through hitting those beaches and go through the whole thing. Now, of course, that being a human thing, carnal warfare, then uh, their training didn't always help them, no matter how well they were trained and how well they were put it, uh, able to put it into practice. But when we as warriors, if you want to call us that, soldiers of Christ, live the Christian life as it's set out plainly in the New Testament, we're going to win. There's no if, ands, or buts about it. And uh, so we should look to Christ as is said by the Hebrews epistle, the author and finisher of our faith. So he's about to undergo these things. Glorify thy son, that the son may glorify thee. May we also point out that as members of his spiritual body, the church, to which he adds every body that's obedient to the faith, believing in Christ, repenting of their sins, confessing one's faith in Christ to be the son of God, and being immersed in water by the authority of Christ to obtain the remission of sins, Acts 2.38. Then one is added by the Lord to his church, which he purchased with his blood, Acts 20, verse 28. That church he promised to build in his earthly ministry, as Matthew records in Matthew 16, 18, and which he did in Acts chapter 2 on that first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ. So that was there's the glory of it all. The Lord's will is being done. You know, that's the only way we in the church 
members of his spiritual body can glorify God. It's through Christ. Well, what does that mean? It means being faithful to him. What does it mean to be faithful? It means to obey what he said. What does it mean to obey him? Well, we'll say it again. To do what he said in the way he said it and for the reason, or if there are more than one reason, that he said do it. That's how I can know that I've obeyed him. Why am I concerned about that? Well, Hebrews 5, 9 tells me why I better be concerned about that. Is that he, Christ, is the author of eternal salvation and do all of them that obey him. Now we're back to where he is now. What is he doing? The final phase of what he came to do in doing his father's will. He's going to die. He's going to obey his father. He says, thou gavest him authority over all mankind. That is the father had given Christ authority over all mankind that to all whom thou hast given him, he may give life eternal, everlasting life. Now, that's interesting the way that's put. Inspiration had John select those words to communicate ideas. But the question arises, how does God give these to Christ? Well, they have to be willing to listen, don't they? And not just listen to anything. They have to be willing to listen to the truth of the Christ and internalize it, understand it, and make the proper application of it to their lives in compliance with it. Remember when Peter confessed in the borders of Caesarea Philippi, when Jesus asked, well, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And uh, they said different ones. And then Peter confessed, you're the Christ. That means the anointed one, the one approved of to do what the Old Testament prophets said he would do. And I simply let Isaiah 53 stand for all of that. And Jesus said, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Well, that tells us then that it's by evidence. It's by credible witnesses. God hasn't asked us to have faith in him or anything he's told us to do simply because he says do it. The book of, of books, the Bible, the sacred volume, is nothing but a book full of evidence saying you can trust me implicitly. Take me at my word. I do not go back on it. When I say to the wicked they're going to be punished, I punish them. When I say to those who are faithful to the righteous that I'm going to save them, I save them. Now, it'd be interesting just to tell a person, go through your Bible and read and try to find out where God ever let anybody down, whether they ever failed to, to, to fulfill or keep a promise. So, how are people delivered by the Father to Christ? They're willing to listen. See, Pharaoh couldn't be delivered to anything to do with serving God. He wouldn't listen. He wouldn't accept the obvious evidence, reason with it, and draw the correct conclusion. That's exactly what God expects us to do. He expects us to do that very thing. Now you say, well, that's not much to expect. But look at how many people fight against it. Look at how many people think. I was visiting with a young man today that I've come to know over a period of a couple of years. And he said something jokingly to me. And I said, well, are you sure of that? And I was joking back, but I was trying to make a point at this time. I said, um, were you implying that or just assuming? He laughed. I said, do you know the difference? He said, no. <laughs> well, that doesn't surprise me. Now, that was just a light matter. But uh, I urged him. I said, well, you ought to think about that a little bit. <laughs> and we laughed. And I'll, I said, well, later on, I may punch at you a little more, so get expected. So I walked off. But I tried to build a little bit of, I guess, camaraderie there with whatever good it'll do. But 
people don't think about things at all. They don't realize that God made us to think. There's proper ways of thought, and we ought to be studying. Now, you may never, just like all of us speak English, I doubt many of us know much about the grammar of it, because it's in man to speak a language. And so it is when we're logical. Uh, all laws of logic do is to make sure we're right on what we're doing and not falling into the assumption, or as I call them, educated guesses. Some of them aren't very educated, but they're still guesses. So we need to realize, what, why is John writing this about Christ right here? And what is Jesus saying in this prayer to the Father as a human being, but yet he is the second person to God in the flesh? Well, he says, uh, all of this happens so that I may give them eternal life. Who's going to be given eternal life? The person is reasonable. No wonder Paul asked the brethren that he, in his request of them and in their prayers for him, that he be delivered from unreasonable men. And that interesting? And he also says unreasonable and wicked men or wicked and unreasonable men. He says, for all men have not faith. There's nobody that has proper faith, confidence, trust, belief at all if they're not reasonable. It's impossibility. No one's going to accidentally get faith as the Bible defines it concerning the faith that saves. So a person must understand that Christianity is a thinking religion. I see all these people get all emotionally worked up. And if you were to ask them what's going on, they'd say, oh, the Holy Spirit made me do it. The Holy Spirit's got a hold of me. He's shaking me around, making me act like an idiot, jumping all over the place and rolling in the sawdust, if there is any sawdust, or anywhere else they can roll, or anything else they might roll in. I remember my grandmother telling me one time that that kind of folks were having a meeting, Brush Arbor meeting. She had a kinfolk who was part of all that and they supposedly got and i'll put this in quotes the holy ghost and they were ripping and roaring and falling and had the dust flying and scared the dogs to death there was always a host of dogs coming with everybody at those meetings and the dogs all jumped all over them and got biting them i thought well i guess uh, i guess uh demons must have had a hold of them but she told that and just laughed. Nobody's business, I guess is the way to put it. But that's what happens. People who are godly people don't act crazy. They are in possession of their faculties. You remember the person who was um, possessed of legion? Running around naked and breaking chains and carrying on. When, when he was... When they cast them out, it said he was clothed and in his right mind. Well, I would say looking around at our society and the unclothed and people not in their right mind, it uh, says something about who's controlling who. So when we look at this matter, John's saying by the Holy Spirit, read this. I'm giving evidence. It's not to make somebody jump backwards and do cartwheels or whatever is to get you to think down and think about the evidence and what it implies about this man, Jesus Christ. So he says, this is life eternal that they may know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thy sin. If you know Jesus Christ, you'll know the Father because you have to study and understand those things. Or if you know the Father, you're going to know the Son because you study the revealed mind of God designed for the creature, for us, for us to get understanding. Thus, an oft-quoted passage, at least among us, is study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Well, ashamed before who? 
ashamed before God if you don't study. The idea of study there is to be studious. American Standard says give diligence. That's the idea. It's to be a very diligent person in the pursuit of the truth of God pertaining not only to him, but to your duties to him. How many people do you think study the Bible to say, I need to learn what God has commanded me to do so I can obey him? I doubt there are very many that even do that because they're taught a religion that says you don't have to obey him in order to be saved. And if you do obey him, you're trying to earn your own salvation and merit your salvation. But that's just not true. He's the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. When you don't obey what you don't know. And so the studiousness must be there. He said, I glorified thee on the earth. He said, uh, I've accomplished the work which thou hast given me to do. Would that all members of the church that he purchased with his blood had that idea as a member, as a living stone, as Peter called them, of the church, the body of Christ, the family of God, that we would have the desire to say, I want to be sure I've done what I was expected to do while I was on the earth. That was the Lord's attitude, and he's the example for every one of us. He says, and now glorify me together with thyself, is really what he's saying, because they're deity. When I say there, I mean the two persons. With the glory which I had with thee before the world was, or ever had with thee. Now that's interesting. Because when we look over here, as I've often referred you to 1 Timothy 2, years and years after this took place, the Lord gone back to heaven, church has started, the gospel has been spread all over the place. And Paul writes to Timothy in verse 5 of 1 Timothy chapter 2, saying to him, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Well, let's try to think about that a little bit. Many years after the Lord returned to heaven and sat at the right hand of God, as Peter declared him to be, ruling over his kingdom in Acts 2, Paul, by inspiration of the third person of the Godhead, writing part of the New Testament of the Christ, still calls him the man, Christ Jesus. Yet here in this prayer, he says, glorify me with glory I had with thee before the world was. Well, let's see, he's still man. He's in the body. He's in heaven, sitting at the right hand of God, but he's glorified. Well, let's put two and two together. Man glorified, he's glorified man. And then John comes along and says, we don't know what we'll be like, but we will be like him. We who, Christians? So those of the human family who are going to be glorified as Christ is presently glorified will be those who are faithful members of the church all the days of their life however long or short that may be, however they leave this world. Thus, Revelation 2, 10, be thou faithful unto in order to death, and you'll receive a crown of life. And all of that goes along with the very points that, that we're making. And all of this is it can be gleaned from this. Of course, there are many other passages, as we refer to others, that deal with this. But uh, you won't become God. We're not saying that. Mormons teach that everybody's going to become God. And with all their uh, various wives, they're going to be able to populate uh, some place somewhere because that's what they believe God did. Can't get much more blasphemous than that, but that's more of a doctrine on those points. I'm simply talking about that you can be glorified as Christ is glorified. And that will be in the resurrected body. Notice that Paul said it, in 1 Corinthians 15, is sown in corruption. But watch it. It, that's the same it. It's not some other thing. It is raised and in corruption. Resurrection. So God is able to do that, and it will be a body 
fitted for eternity, and it will be a glorified body, even as the Lord presently has. According to the same human writer, inspired of the Holy Spirit, that is writing this material right here, John the Apostle. And now glorify thou me together with thyself, with the glory which I ever had with thee before the world was. I don't understand all of that. I won't pretend to. I just know that glory here is uh, a description of uh, what? A great royal display of magnificence beyond a mortal mind to comprehend or to ever grasp in this life. Then he says, I manifested thy name to the men whom thou gavest me out of the world. Now he's talking about the apostle. Remember, he's still in prayer to his father. He says, thine they were, and thou gavest them to me, and they kept thy word. Again, notice the business of them willing to follow him and to follow the word, to what it meant. The evidence is offered that he's the son of God. Now they've come to know that everything thou hast given me is from thee. So we know a little bit about them. They There's a lot they don't know. A lot they don't know about the kingdom. They don't understand yet that uncircumcised Gentiles have a right to the gospel. They'll understand that later on. But they understand this. Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the only begotten Son of God. He says, the word you gave me, I've given to them. And notice, they received these words. That's the point we've been making all through this prayer. They received these words. And notice, they, they truly understand that I came forth from thee, and they believe that thou didst send me. That had to be definitely established in them before all the other things that they were to do could take place. Now, that's the part of this chapter 17 to where Jesus is praying for himself. But when you come into verse 9 all the way through verse 18, he's praying for the apostles there, the disciples. And he says, I pray on their behalf. Uh, I have glorified I have been glorified in them. I am no more in the world, but they're in the world. I'm coming to thee, but I'm concerned about them. Keep them in thy name, that they may be one, even as we are. Well, keep them in thy name. How are they going to stay in the fold? How are they going to stay acceptable to the Father? Well, in his own name. But what does it mean? Just call out his name? It means doing things that he's authorized. We forget because we've never lived under an absolute monarchy. For that matter, I doubt anybody in America very much, at least most people, have ever lived in any kind of monarchy. But the kingdom of Christ is an absolute monarchy. His word is law. Jesus said, he that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The words that I have spoken, these same shall judge him in the last day, John 12, 48. Thus, he's going to keep the apostles because they'll listen to his word. They will follow it. He says, while I was with them, I was keeping them in thy name. He said, I guarded them. Basically what he's talking about. And he says, not one of them is perished, but the son of perdition. Of course, that was Judas Iscariot who betrayed him. And he says, that was that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now, what's the situation? I'm coming to thee. He says, I've given them thy word. And the world's hated them for the simple reason they're not of the world. What does it mean to be worldly? What does it mean to be of the world? What does it mean to be not of the world? Worldly people aren't guided and directed and motivated by God's truth. The people who come to God are persuaded by his truth. Now we're back to John 8, 31 and 32, aren't we? 
where Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now, just a little later on out here, we'll touch on it then. He'll say, Father, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. But it ties in very well right here. So if they're going to be kept, they're going to have to follow the truth pertaining to being Christians and what God expected them to do as apostles of Christ. Now, some people get the idea, I'm quite sure, well, they had all of this going for them supernaturally from the Holy Spirit. They had no problem. Well, Peter certainly did. You know, Peter did not, when he was in Antioch of Syria and with the church there, which was a Gentile church, he never taught a false doctrine. Never taught a false doctrine at all. There's nothing in the Bible that says Peter ever taught that uncircumcised Gentiles must be circumcised, keep the law to be saved. Others did. What was Peter's problem? When certain came down from Jerusalem, he got afraid. And he pulled off from eating with those Gentile brethren. Now, I, I seem to get the idea from a lot of folks nowadays, unless somebody pretty much denies God and the deity of Christ and the whole Bible, well, just kind of leave that person alone. What would have happened if Paul had not withstood Peter the faith? What kind of leadership would he have uh, had an example for all the rest? Because some followed him. Remember, Barnabas is good as the Bible describes him. Now, he still was caught up in Peter's hypocrisy. That's what the King James Version means, dissimulation. And Peter played the hypocrite. what he did. And Paul says, I was stood into the face because he was to be blamed. One sin. No false doctrine taught by word of mouth or by pen, but by action. A bad example. And Paul was stood him to the face. Now we rightly talk about, and so we ought to talk more about it, of doing only what the divine pattern the New Testament authorizes us to do. But I don't know how many brethren I know, including great many preachers, don't get the point, at least the point I just made, concerning Peter's sin. There was no false doctrine taught by word of mouth or by writing. He simply was a hypocrite. He set a very bad example, a sinful example, and it could not stand. He's an apostle of Christ besides being a Christian. But that didn't mean that he couldn't be withstood to the face for the sin he committed. Of course, he had had the Lord deal with him a few times on things he did that was wrong. And it didn't make any difference how ignorant he might have been or sincere in his ignorance. It was wrong. And Paul withstood him to the face. No indication that Peter got all upset at Paul over it. In fact, later on, in writing his epistles, he called Paul our beloved brother Paul. But that's not the way men think. Men get the idea, if you love me, let me sin. And you don't call it to my attention. That's not what the Bible calls love. Paul who wrote 1 Corinthians 13, that great treatise on love, agape love, the kind of love God has for us. That love drove him to immediately deal with the Apostle Peter's hypocritical actions. And he won't let us alone either. Either. One thing to confess we are to love the brethren, and we are. Another thing to practice that love when the chips are down, as we might say. So I pray on their behalf. So I've been glorified in them. I'm no more in the world. They themselves are in the world. I'm coming to thee. Keep them in thy name, that they may be one, even as we are one. Um, while I was with them, I kept them. But I'm now coming to thee. So I'm giving them the word and they know that the world hated me and they know they're going to be hated. I read the book of acts. That's as good as any to show you how the world hated them. 
the world or people are motivated by the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life. That's how you're worldly. Those things are more important to you than what the Bible says. And you can see how somebody like Peter falls into a trap. You know Peter didn't go there thinking, well, I'm going to, I'm only going to meet with these Gentile Christians until Jewish Christians come down to Jerusalem, then I'm going to pull off. No, he got caught just like he did, and others of the apostles did, boasting at the time that Christ was arrested and found out their faith was not nearly as strong as their mouth was. He says, I'm not asking thee to take them out of the world, but he's saying to keep them from the evil one. That's interesting. This is a prayer that Jesus is offering on behalf and for the good of the apostles. And yet he says, I'm not asking you to take them out of this, this place where Satan has access to. Now, a lot of times we get the idea the best thing for us is to be taken out of a mess. But that's not what happens. Jesus wanted them to stay in the place they were, but to be faithful, if you were said this way, in the mess they were in. Mess being this world and the way this world operates. I think there's a reason for that. It's because this world was designed so that we would be able to grow and develop spiritually. And you can't do that if you don't. Well, let me give you this example. How is a person going to demonstrate mercy if there's not somebody there that needs your mercy? How is a person going to be able to be the servant that Christ has already taught them they must be, that he that be greatest among you that he be, will be your servant if there's not somebody to serve? How do you fight the devil if there's no place to resist him? If there's no drawing power of the devil that you resist? And on and on you could go. So this world is a place to get ready for eternity. And we do it by faith, a faith that's reasonable. And that comes by the word of God, taking God at his word. And no matter what anybody does or says, no matter uh, what comes our way that's contrary to the doctrine of Christ, we don't quit. Yep, they may put you in prison. You don't quit. They may do this, that, or the other to you that's painful or deprives you of things. Well, it doesn't change what the Bible says. So we're back now to what I quoted a moment ago, sanctify them through the truth. Thy word is truth. The idea of sanctify. Well, they're in the world, but they can't be of the world. The word's given so they can not be a part of the world. Well, how does that work? Well, you won't be part of the world if you follow the truth of God. I simply refer you back to John 8, 31, 32. Sanctify means set apart. How are we going to be set apart from the world? Not a hard process. Just follow the teachings of the Bible. Keep the truth of God. Obey his commandments. Now, as we say most often, let's hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. And thus, that's how we're kept from the evil one. That's how we stay separate from those who are motivated by the flesh and the appetites thereof who are not directed by the rightly divided word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. He says, as thou didst send me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. So we have something to do. The apostles, of course, had a special work, as we already studied, and I won't repeat it. But the church itself is expected to be the leavening influence for good in the world by the lives we live, and by the truth we preach and defend. Now he comes down, verses 19 through 23, to those who are not apostles of Christ. He's going to pray for you and for me now. So he prayed for others that would come to believe in verses 19 through 23. So I don't pray just for the apostles alone, but for those who believe in me through their word. Now, remember what we said in Acts 2.42 concerning the early church, right? After it started, that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Well, notice 
He says, if they continue through their word, the apostle's word, why their word? Well, remember what all we've said about the comforter who's the Holy Spirit who would remind them of everything Christ taught them and guide them into all truth. Thus, infallibly, they would teach. Teach what? The doctrine of Christ, the truths of Christ, the gospel of Christ, the faith for which we are to contend, Jude verse 3. So I pray that these may all be one. Now, let me emphasize here, the denominational world does not believe this. The denominational world believes that you can have all sorts and sizes of churches. I read something just there so ago that said some 9,000 denominations. I don't know how accurate that is, but it doesn't surprise me. And every one of them says God is the Father or somewhere or another, and the Bible is the Word of God, and Christ is our Savior, but they don't believe there ought to be one. Now, one is one is one. You can't get more one than one. So God expected those who are disciples of Christ, who are Christians, to be one. Not to be one in the sense of embracing false doctrine and allowing it to stand. That's obvious from what we've already said. But for those who believe on him through their word, they're to be as together and have oneness as the Father and Christ are one. For a reason, that the world may believe without its sin. Denominationalism stands as probably the greatest thing among believers in Christ that saying to a lost world, God didn't send this mess. And yet denominational people refuse, adamantly, consistently refuse to acknowledge the terrible sinfulness of denominationalism. But it couldn't be any more sinful than anything else. We think about well, fornication and homosexuality and all that kind of thing of moral sins. Yes, it's terrible. Works of the flesh. Galatians 5 says you do those things, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. The more people are moved to be immoral today. Some just are moral. That means without morals of some sort. They're removed from any standard that says right or wrong morally. But denominationalism lets you believe that everything is all right with you and your God. And yet you're not one as Jesus and the Father are one. Well, we've got to, I'll, I'll be a good place to pick up on this again as we start next week. But before we uh, close, let's go to Heavenly Father in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful for thy word that leads us and guides us and directs us if we let it. Help us, Father, to live our lives thinking about it, studying it, meditating on it, reminding ourselves of what it says. And may we have the self-discipline to bring ourselves in subjection to it. And as the church, to know the importance of standing for it and preaching it, living it out in our daily lives. Be with us all throughout this day and help us as brethren to help each other come to a better knowledge and practice of the truth. Look down upon us with tender mercy and may we have the same mercy toward others. Help us to hate sin and love righteousness. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.